Good morning and good afternoon and welcome to the April 2022 DTN WASD webinar. My name is Andy Miller with DTN. I'll be your moderator today. And with me is Todd Holtman, Lead Market Analyst for DTN. So before we get started with Todd, just want to remind everybody that this event, uh, everyone who is participating will be in listen-only mode. Um, please ask questions at any time during the event in the Q&A section in the bottom right of your screen. Um, just a heads up that any question you uh, enter will not be viewable by other attendees and will be addressed during the Q&A session at the end of Todd's presentation. So that's really the basics here. Um, other than we'll also be rebroadcasting this uh, on DTN.com in our webinar section within the next 48 hours. So if you'd like to review, um, you can do it then. Uh, otherwise, that's it. I'm going to just turn it over to you, Todd. Thank you, Andy. Thank you, uh, everybody. Welcome to our report review of April's WASD report. It's the last WASD report before we get to the new crop estimates, which come out on May 12th. So. Uh, there are a few things to look at today. One of the biggest uh, attention items is going to be a check on South American crops. Uh, we'll have updates of Brazil's corn and soybean crop estimates, as well as from Argentina uh, as uh, uh, things are developing down there. Of course, uh, we'll also have some adjustments that we'll look out from the Ukraine situation. I was looking over the Ukraine news this morning, just waiting for the report to come out. And things still look fairly gruesome, of course. Uh, it sounds like the fighting has intensified in eastern Ukraine. There's some horrific stories there. Wall Street Journal had uh, a story of a poultry plant in southern Ukraine that got hit especially hard. They've lost something like four, 4 million chickens simply because they haven't been able to feed and water them properly. And uh, this is a plant that supposedly produce, uh, exports over a billion eggs per year. And that, uh, that production ability is being lost. So all kinds of tentacles coming from uh, the war situation. And of course, that continues to dominate the trade and our grain prices. But uh, we will take a moment out here today to see what WASDI said for their latest monthly estimates. So let's go ahead and get started. And as usual, we'll start with the numbers for corn. Here's the uh, USDA balance sheet, US balance sheet for corn. And the far right column are today's latest estimates for the month of April. We're still in the 2021 to 22 crop season. That ends on August 31st. We have roughly five months uh, remaining, or four and a half, something like that. Um, as you can see in the lower right corner at the rectangle, the ending stocks estimate for corn today stayed unchanged, 1.44 billion bushels. Uh, the, US, the Dow Jones survey of analysts was actually looking for a small reduction, uh, but that did not happen today. There were only really two items to note here uh, that changed in the corn estimates. The feed estimate uh, changed. It uh, was reduced by 25 million bushels down to 5.625 billion bushels. And I have to uh, wonder if that isn't related to the spread of bird flu that we're seeing uh, so widely throughout the, really the entire U.S., but especially here uh, in the Midwest, where there's been uh, quite a bit of loss, uh, primarily in Iowa, of uh, poultry uh, flocks. Uh, at the same time, we saw a 25 million uh, bushel increase in the uh, corn estimate for ethanol demand, now at 5.375 uh, billion bushels. And even though ethanol inventories are seasonally high this time of year, we have seen ethanol production hold up quite well. It's been running 10% above last year's pace. So uh, that's certainly in line with what we've been seeing uh, to see the higher demand estimate. Corn exports were unchanged today, uh, 2.5 billion bushels. No change there in the export estimate. We had a little excitement in the corn market earlier this week when uh, China showed up with a big purchase of roughly 43 million bushels that was divided between old crop uh, and new crop. Now we'll look at the world estimates for corn and we'll start in the upper right hand corner where we see the new ending stocks estimate of uh, world ending stocks for corn has increased from roughly 301 to 305 and a half million metric tons. Um, that's uh, a 4.5 million metric ton increase, and 
where did that come from? Well, let's take a look at the uh, red rectangles on the board. We'll, we'll work our way from left to right, and we'll uh, start in the second column with the crop estimates for Brazil and Argentina. There we see USDA's estimates of Argentina's corn crop stayed unchanged at 53 million metric tons. That was a bit of a surprise. We were looking for a small reduction there. The reports have not been good out of Argentina lately. Uh, of course, just yesterday they came out with lower crop ratings, but they've, they've been under the stress of dry forecasts for some time now. The Brazilian corn crop estimate was increased from 114 to 116 million metric tons. That's a 2 million metric ton increased. Uh, as you know, the second corn crop in Brazil was recently planted. They had fairly good rains to start. At DTN, however, I have to mention we are very concerned about a drier weather pattern ahead, especially in central Brazil, where it looks like the rainy season has ended already. Uh, there's still a rain chance in the, in the southern Brazil area, but uh, central Brazil uh, looks uh, to have a drier forecast ahead. So it'll be interesting to see if this new 116 uh, million, million metric ton estimate can hold up as the season goes on. Uh, I, I, uh, I, I lied. I said we're going to work from left to right, but I'd like to just go down a little bit here and look at Ukraine's number, uh, which is in the far right column. And we'll see that Ukraine's export estimate today uh, was reduced for corn from 27.5 to 23 million metric tons. Uh, obviously not a surprise with the wartime situation going on. Most of the 23 million metric tons in this estimate has probably already been exported uh, because uh, exports since the war began in late February have been extremely difficult. Uh, Ukraine is just not suited to uh, transport massive uh, amounts of grain out the west end of the country. They, they rely on their uh, Black Sea ports. And of course, those are closed for business right now with Russian naval vessels uh, bottling up the Black Sea. So exporting grain out of Ukraine continues to be very difficult uh, in this situation. The, it's interesting that the export estimate for Ukraine was reduced by 4.5 million metric tons, but their ending stocks were only increased by 2.2 million metric tons. Um, so we have to assume that USDA made some allowance there for some grain, grain being destroyed. And we have heard reports of grain facilities in eastern Ukraine being destroyed uh, by Russian missiles. Um, so that kind of uh, tends to reflect what's happening here. Now, of course, the big question that everybody wants to know is how much corn, wheat, barley, sunflower will Ukraine be able to plant uh, and produce in the year ahead. Uh, we're getting closer to spring planting time. Some has actually already begun uh, in Ukraine, and that, that's the big question at the moment. And uh, those estimates won't come from USDA until May 12, however. That, uh, that, that uh, new crop season is not a part of today's report. Okay, now let's move to the bottom of the report, and I want to uh, point your attention to China's numbers today. And China's demand estimate actually being reduced 3 million metric tons from 294 to 291 million metric tons. The import estimate on corn being reduced from 26 million metric tons down to 23 uh, million metric tons. So that 3 million uh, metric ton uh, reduction, along with Brazil's crop increase of 2 million metric tons, uh, for the most part, largely explains today's increase in the ending stocks estimate, which, by the way, was larger uh, than expected. So if there is a surprise here today, it's that USDA reduced China's demand estimate for corn by 3 million metric tons. Now, uh, I don't know if USDA's uh, thinking on this is related to the spread of COVID in China. I hope not. At least the numbers we're getting out of the country suggests that the, the cases are up to 20,000 people. That's not, uh, you know, a, a big significant amount that you would expect to hurt corn demand. Uh, but uh, Shanghai is locked down, and, and that's probably a larger concern 
overall, uh, in my view, people are still going to eat. So I'm I'm not exactly sure what explains uh, the the uh, lower estimate of corn demand uh, in China at this time. Cash prices. So now uh, that we stay, you, or USDA is staying with the ending stocks estimate of 1.44 billion bushels. What should that mean for cash prices? Well, in a normal world, if we, if we were comparing today's supply situation to uh, previous times in the past when we also had a 10% ending stocks to use ratio, as this report does, uh, we would expect cash corn prices to trade close to $5.10 a bushel. Uh, obviously, corn is trading much higher than that today. Last night's close on our DTN national index average was $7.34, and a lot of that is uh, related to not only the South American drought this year, but also the, uh, con the concerns about lack of production and exports coming out of Ukraine in the year ahead. And we can also add to that a certain fear premium. Uh, this is this continues to be a market that's uh, very paralyzed by just the uncertainty of what Russia might do, do next and what their uh, plans are in the situation. So it continues to be a very difficult, highly anxious market we're looking at. Doesn't really compare well to the past, as you can see from this uh, historical comparison. How about corn exports? Um, actually, uh, corn shipments have been doing quite well. They're only down 6% from the pace uh, of a year ago. And, of course, that was a record pace of corn exports we had a year ago. Total sales and commitments, just over 2.1 billion bushels, are down 18% from a year ago. At this time, USDA is estimating a 9% uh, decline in uh, in uh, the corn exports uh, from a year ago. So we still have about 21 weeks left uh, in the season ahead. Uh, lots of time to learn more. I guess uh, one little surprise is if uh, China's uh, demand estimate is being reduced by 3 million metric tons and their import estimates being reduced by that much, uh, it's a bit of a surprise maybe that it did not show up as a ex uh, reduction in U.S. Uh, exports, as uh, uh, China has been an interested buyer of corn from the U.S., especially with Ukraine out of the picture right now. This is uh, the price of uh, corn on China's Dalian Exchange, and uh, it's, I, I think, probably the best indicator we have of what's actually happening in the country, and that's why I like to keep track of it. As you can see here, uh, May corn prices on the Dalian Exchange have been trading at uh, some of their highest levels, probably on record. Uh, the current price uh, this morning translates to $11.37 a bushel, suggesting that China still needs to buy corn. And so uh, that fit in quite well with the news on Monday that uh, China did show up here in the U.S. to buy uh, roughly 43 million bushels of corn, and I wouldn't be surprised if they don't come back for more. How about the corn basis? Uh, well, here is our basis map, and I, I understand if it uh, is a little difficult to read or it looks a bit like a mess, uh, but overall this, this is the cash corn prices being uh, bid around the Midwest, and uh, as you can see, they remain quite high. $7.34 is the national average that we're getting from this uh, map and grain bid exercise. That's up $0.20 cents from what we were looking at a month ago. Now, keep in mind the cash basis has changed, so the basis uh, currently is being tallied off of the July contract simply because when Russia attacked Ukraine, there was so much speculative excitement and and such a buying panic that shot into the May contract, it just became um, uh, too difficult for commercials to keep up with that May contract in terms of their cash bids. So they moved their bids to be based off the July contracts. We have a very unusual situation uh, that we have developing here earlier in the year. We don't normally uh, go off of the July contract at this time, but uh, th this is the type of market we're in today. 
the uh, basis of 16 cents below July, still quite firm, second strongest we have in nine years. Of course, last year was uh, the strongest basis of that period. The corn spread tells us a lot about the excitement level this year in corn. As you can see on this chart of May to July corn, uh, May corn prices got uh, well above 50 cents a bushel in excess over and, and beyond the July price early in March, and that coincided with the panic in the markets that erupted after Russia attacked Ukraine. And uh, it, it was a mix, I would say, of speculative activity, but also end users scrambling to buy supplies. And so uh, you can see, however, since early March, the spread has come down significantly. And where now the May contract is priced roughly eight cents above the July, it's a much calmer uh, indication of market activity, but it's also uh, slightly bullish. Uh, there still is competition for that May corn contract which suggests good, strong demand for physical corn underneath. The speculative positions in corn have actually increased a little bit, even after Russia attacked Ukraine. Uh, bulls don't seem to be, have any fear on the long side of this market. Non-commercial net longs and non-commercials uh, is the uh, CFTC's name for speculators. Uh, but non-commercial net longs are over 482,000 in the latest report. That's uh, historically a very heavy load. And the concern, of course, is that if anything happens to turn prices back lower, if they start breaking support at some point with some change in the situation, that's a lot of speculators that have to get out of the market or will be pressured to get out of the market. So at some point, that uh, could become a bearish concern. But right now, with the market as strong as they is, as it is, uh, obviously the speculative side of the market is doing quite well with their uh, large bullish positions. Okay, let's move to soybeans and see what USDA said in the April report. And again, we'll start with the U.S. balance sheet, the far right column being today's estimates. And we basically uh, only see one significant change in the soybean balance sheet today, the export estimate was increased 25 million bushels, and there's good reason for that I'll talk about uh, in just a minute. And actually, we anticipated that USDA would probably increase the export estimate today. There were two minor changes. The, uh, the, the estimate of soybeans for seed was increased 4 million bushels, and the residual account was reduced by 3 million bushels. So they basically offset each other. And uh, I don't think there's anything to be too concerned about. Um, the the uh, increase in seed obviously going with the larger than expected planting estimate that USDA announced last week, a record high 91 million acres out of their planting intentions survey. So they're making a little allowance for that. At the end of the day, the new ending stocks estimate for soybeans in the lower right corner, we see 260 million bushels. That's down 25 million bushels from last month's estimate. Uh, and uh, it's very close to what the trade was expecting today. It's also very close to last year's ending stocks of 257 million bushels uh, for soybeans. So we continue to be in a very tight situation domestically uh, for, for soybeans. And of course, uh, Brazil's and Argentina's drought damage uh, that has gone on this year has a lot to do with uh, the strong demand that we're seeing here in the U.S. for soybeans this year. Looking at the world numbers, we'll start with the upper right corner and we'll see just a slight reduction in USDA's estimate of soybean stocks going from roughly 90 million bushels down to 89, or not million bushels, sorry, going from roughly 90 million metric tons down to roughly 89.6. So it's just a very small reduction. But there were a few interesting changes to talk about. Uh, starting on the left again, we'll look at the tall rectangle in the second column and look at the three South American crop estimates from Argentina, Brazil, and Paraguay. USDA kept Argentina's soybean crop estimate unchanged at 43.5 million metric tons. 
We were actually looking for uh, about 1 million metric tons lower today, but that did not happen. Uh, it wouldn't be a surprise to see that estimate come down still in the future as Argentina still contends, uh, contends with uh, dry conditions uh, with where their crops are. Uh, the crop estimate for Brazil was reduced from 127 million metric tons down to 125 million metric tons. Uh, that's a 2 million metric ton drop and uh, is in line exactly with what Dow Jones survey of analysts was expecting today. Now we should also note that Brazil's crop agency, their, their counterpart to USDA, uh, estimated 122.4 million metric tons here on Thursday. That's, if true, that would be a 4.5 billion bushel crop. But uh, needless to say, that's, that's all down uh, quite a bit from uh, the, the uh, larger estimate uh, that uh, we were looking at earlier this year before drought hit. So Brazil's soybean crop has taken a significant hit, and USDA uh, reduces that a bit again today. In Paraguay, uh, a minor reduction from 5.3 down to 4.2 million metric tons there. So uh, between the three of them, I think it was about, uh, yeah, about a 3.1 million metric ton reduction for those three. Now if we look uh, down and to the right, we see two little squares for China, and we see that China's soybean import estimate was reduced by USDA from 94 to 91 million metric tons. Uh, similar to corn, USDA made a 3 million metric ton drop there. Uh, China's demand estimate overall for corn was also reduced 3 million metric tons. So again, I have to wonder, is that related to the uh, news of Shanghai being locked down for COVID and the rising cases, uh, I, I, um, I, I guess I have a lot of skepticism about this reduction. I'm, I'm not sure it's going to stand by the time we get to the end of the season, but uh, time will tell uh, on that matter. And I'll, I'll show you uh, more market clues ahead, which show that uh, the demand prospects out of China still look very good. Uh, on the right uh, side of the, the balance sheet, I noted the uh, local ending stocks estimates for Brazil and Argentina. Uh, keep in mind that the, the, fig the South American figures that you see in this table from USDA are mid-season estimates. Uh, they, they try to match up the US and South America all at the same time. Uh, so we're not getting a true picture of ending stocks estimates for South America. If we looked at uh, those numbers from USDA in a different report, we see that USDA is estimating uh, ending stocks of soybeans for Brazil at just 72 million bushels at the end of their local season, which ends on the end of January. For Argentina, that local ending stocks estimate is 176 million bushels. That's down from last month's report. So uh, as far as South America is concerned, uh, not only are they looking for aggressive exports out of South America, but another year of very tight ending supplies uh, of soybeans in South America. Cash prices, uh, historically speaking, what would a 6% ending stocks to use ratio, which we have in this report, what would that work out to? And uh, the historical target is roughly $12.50 uh, is the answer. Uh, and of course, uh, as with corn, we're trading well above that. Last night's uh, DTN index settled at 15.84, so we're over three dollars uh, above that uh, historical target uh, that uh, we see for this supply situation that USDA is estimating. And again, there's a lot of bullishness built into the market, largely due to South American drought. Plus, Ukraine has had an influence. Higher crude oil prices has also have. Uh, and influence for soybeans, but we continue to see uh, very strong demand factors even at these higher levels, which I'll point, get to here in a second. Soybean exports uh, actually are doing quite well. Uh, this shows the situation as of March 31st. The red line is the uh, current soybean export path. Uh, total shipments, 1.63 billion bushels, are down 19% from last year's record pace. If we look at total sales and shipments, however, 
uh, it's actually uh, above 2 billion bushels, 2.06 billion bushels. That's down 7% from last year's record pace. And last year's record pace is signified by the green shading uh, on this chart. The black line is the four-year average. So you can see we're well above the four-year average. Uh, and uh, we're, we're, we're down, of course, compared to the, the record pace of last year. But one other thing I want to note is that our total sales and shipments of soybeans right now, which just came out in yesterday morning, Thursday morning's uh, weekly report, we're already up to 2.063 billion bushels. As I uh, show here, that's just 27 million bushels short of the export estimate USDA had before they increased it today. So if you recall, uh, they increased that estimate from 2.09 up to 2.115. So overall, USDA is looking for soybean exports to be down 6% uh, from a year ago. Our, and our current salesman uh, commitments are still pretty close to that number with 21 weeks uh, remaining. The uh, Another reason, I think, to um, still consider this a bullish situation is simply because of the fact that because of drought in Brazil, because they're having a lower soybean harvest this year, uh, we're also likely to have a more active export season through the summer and into the fall. And it's quite possible that China will be back uh, for U.S. business uh, sooner than they usually are. And actually, we've we've seen recently uh, purchases from China for old crop soybeans here in the U.S. And I'll talk about that more here in, a, in another chart. Here is a comparison of Brazil's soybean prices to uh, FOB soybean prices at the U.S. Gulf. This is based on the month of July. So keep in mind, these are summer prices for the month of July. The brown line is Brazil, and uh, the green line is the U.S. Gulf. So you can see that in the month of July, we're significantly cheaper than Brazil, roughly 69 cents a bushel. Uh, in this particular snapshot taken yesterday. So it's another indication that the market's expecting tight supplies of Brazil to lead to earlier U.S. business uh, this summer. That's a bullish indication. How about the soybean prices themselves in China? Uh, well, we saw quite a surge early this year, both of soybeans and soybean meal prices in China. Uh, but just recently, they have pulled back uh, somewhat. Uh, they've pulled back from their highest price levels in nine years, but they do still remain well supported. It's not like they've broken support and have uh, given up hope here, at least not yet. May soybeans on the Dalian Exchange ended this morning at the equivalent of $21.22 a bushel. So it's still what I would consider a bullish demand scenario. Uh, as far as China still needing to buy soybeans uh, from outside sources. And, of course, more and more, it looks like uh, the U.S. may be one of the few markets that will have beans for them here before too long. U.S. soybean prices, uh, again, here we have our cash bids across the Midwest, largely. And you see a lot of numbers in the upper 15s and the lower 16s, the overall average uh, of our DTN National Soybean Index is $15.84 last night. That's down $0.33 cents from where it was uh, a month ago. The cash basis is $0.43 cents below the July contract. That's still the second strongest basis we've seen in eight years. So this, uh, this is still a, a, a map that shows uh, very firm uh, soybean bids and good soybean demand here in the U.S., Soybean futures, uh, somewhat like the corn, the May-July uh, soybean spread uh, had a big surge as Russia was attacking Ukraine. We saw the same, not only speculative surge for May soybeans, but also uh, probably some panic buying among end users to secure supplies. That largely peaked in early March. The May has been calming down somewhat since then, but still maintains a pretty healthy $0.22 cent premium in the May contract over the July. So we're still seeing a very firm commercial demand here. 
if we get to the end of the month where we get close to the delivery period for May soybeans and we're still sporting uh, a pretty strong premium over the July, that would be a very strong indication of just uh, how much in need commercials are for more soybeans. So this will be an interesting one to watch in the weeks ahead. The bullish driver of soybeans continues to be the crush values in the market, and this chart bears that out. The blue line on top, and this is all based on the May futures prices, by the way, but the blue line on top is the value of bean oil and soybean meal when they are crushed from a bushel of soybeans. And you can see that they come up with a combined value of $19.37. Last night's cost of May soybeans was $16.46. That leaves us a crush premium of $2.92. That's one of the largest premiums historically we've seen over the past many, many years. Uh, so again, the combination of strong demand for both meal and bean oil having a very bullish influence on our U.S. crush demand and demand for soybeans overall. Here in the U.S., as we look at the speculative positions, which are the red bars on the lower chart, we see that non-commercials are bullish. They're holding on to their net long positions uh, even after Russia attacked Ukraine, but they aren't really adding to their positions since this time. They're, they're staying uh, pretty much holding pat and uh, maybe it's understandable with all the uncertainty in the market and not knowing uh, just what might happen from this point. So we see uh, uh, commercials bullish, yet a little bit cautious. As of the most recent report, uh, speculators were net long over 206,000 contracts. Okay, third crop of the day, we'll take a look at USDA's wheat estimates. And as we turn to the U.S. balance sheet and look in the lower right corner, we see that the ending stocks estimate for wheat was increased from 653 million bushels to 678 million bushels for the month of April. That was higher than expected. Uh, the trade was expecting really just uh, virtually an unchanged uh, estimate in this month's report, uh, yet we see a 25 million bushel increase, and it came largely from two sources. Uh, the first source at the top, feed demand for wheat, was reduced by 10 million bushels. That's probably not too uh, much of a shock or surprise given the high prices that we're seeing for wheat this year. The uh, second change uh, was a 15 million reduction in the export estimate for wheat going from 800 down to 785. And of course, uh, that has not been a surprise either as wheat exports have struggled all year long. Uh, and are down 24% from a year ago. Uh, the one reason that the trade did expect ending stocks to stay unchanged, however, was because in the, the uh, quarterly grain stocks report for the March 1st wheat tally, we saw USDA estimate a lower than expected total of 1.025 uh, billion bushels, but that really did not translate through to this WASDE report uh, in any significant way as you see here, as we see a little higher uh, estimate for wheat ending stocks. Rest assured, 678 million bushels of ending wheat stocks is still the lowest total in eight years for U.S. wheat supplies. As we look at the uh, what the changes were like according to category, in the uh, left column we see that the ending stocks estimate for hard red winter wheat was increased 10 million bushels from 356 up to 366 million bushels. That was largely due to a 10 million bushel drop in the export estimate. And then if we look at the second red square under the soft red winter wheat column, we see a 15 million bushel increase in the ending stocks estimate uh, for soft red winter wheat. So a little less demand uh, for both of those increased the ending stocks. All the other categories stayed virtually uh, where they were at in last month's report. Now, of course, wheat is a world crop, and the world estimates uh, mean a lot. So we take a look at the at USDA's world estimates here, and in the upper right corner, we see that USDA reduced its estimate of world-ending wheat stocks from 281.5 million metric tons down to 278.4 million metric tons. 
that's a, a drop of just over 3 million metric tons uh, for ending stocks, and that was a, a slight bullish surprise here today. The And, and let me just jump to the uh, quick answer. Uh, what What is it that brought about the lower ending stocks today? Well, you see my note in the right-hand margin. The demand estimate for India was actually increased by 4.4 million metric tons today. That was the surprise uh, that took ending stocks down lower. Now we can look at the uh, other mentions here, and uh, let's just work from top down. So we can see that the Argentine crop estimate for wheat was increased slightly uh, from 20.5 to 21 million metric tons. Not a big change there. But it's also interesting, given what's happening in Ukraine, that we take a look at today's estimate changes for both Russia and Ukraine. In the case of Russia, and we see that at the bottom of the report, in the case of Russia, the export estimate was increased from 32 to 33 million metric tons, and their ending stocks level was reduced by 1 million metric tons. So they took a million metric tons out of ending stocks and uh, put it into the export category. Of course, uh, we've heard several reports that Russia continues to ship grain throughout this time, so they have not been hindered the same way Ukraine has. When we look at the lowest level uh, on this balance sheet, we see Ukraine's estimate, and there we see a 1 million metric ton reduction in the export estimate for Ukraine, going from 20 to 19, uh, and ending stocks actually increased a little bit, not the full million metric tons by but by uh, 600,000 uh, metric tons on that. So uh, once again, quite understandable in the situation we're in. And, and again, those are old crop export estimates that we're looking at. The new crop season won't be addressed until next month's report. Now, because the uh, drop in world ending stocks came largely from India, and India is not one of, has not been one of the world's top wheat exporters. Uh, when we look at the ending wheat stocks for the top eight exporters, uh, India's demand increase really did not show up. As uh, so, the top eight ending stocks at the top eight exporters did not go down today. Is what I'm trying to say. Uh, it actually went up slightly from 2.06 billion bushels last month. The new ending stocks level for the top eight are 2.15 uh, billion bushels. That's still the lowest in eight years. So this is a, a very slight change that we see in today's report. And, and an indication that uh, supplies are tight going into the new season where we're probably gonna see a drastic reduction from Ukraine's participation. What about cash hard red winter wheat prices? Uh, given that USDA has increased the ending stocks estimate today and the ending stocks to use ratio is now at 36%, uh, what would HRW wheat prices normally trade at with that supply level? And the answer on the chart is $5.60. But again, uh, the, the real price of HRW wheat, uh, looking at DTN's national index of grain bids for that particular commodity was $10.16 last night. So we're well above historic norms, but it's no surprise that uh, much of the inflated fear factor is coming from Ukraine. As we look at the basis situation for HRW wheat, uh, the most recent basis shows up on this chart as the green line, and you see the sharp drop that we had a little while ago, and uh, that was uh, related to the change when Russia attacked Ukraine. And I think it's fair to say that uh, commercials widened the basis to take some production, pro, excuse me, take some protection uh, in this very volatile and uncertain uh, situation. But we're slowly climbing back. Uh, cash basis currently is 57 cents below the July contract. As I mentioned, DTM's index is at $10.16 last night. That was up $0.09 cents from a month ago. So the cash prices themselves are holding firm in this situation, and the basis is coming back 
uh, although the current level is the weakest in five years. Uh, I wouldn't necessarily say that this means that this is a, 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 a troubled demand situation for cash HRW wheat, because obviously we have uh, very low supplies here still in the U.S. and very high prices. KC wheat, looking at the speculative element here, um, we have basically over 45,000 non-commercials holding net longs, uh, and they've basically held pat uh, since Russia has attacked Ukraine. And of course, uh, prices surge much higher, so they're doing quite well on their speculative positions. Uh, but uh, they aren't necessarily adding to them, so there's nothing crazy going on here. And uh, again, I think it's understandable to see perhaps a little bit of a, a conscious, uh, just hold, or a cautious, I should say, uh, stance on their uh, positions at this time. It's, it's a very volatile and highly uncertain market. Uh, probably not a good time to think about adding to your positions uh, in this situation. Okay. At the end of the day, uh, I would have to say that this April report from USDA was largely neutral for all three crops. Uh, in the case of corn, we saw ending stocks stayed unchanged. We did see world ending stocks more than expected, but the reduced demand from China uh, estimates, I think, are somewhat questionable and for both corn and soybeans on that front, uh, and, and we'll see if that proves out in time. For soybeans, we did see a reduction in the ending stocks estimate, but it was roughly as expected before the report, uh, so not a major surprise there. We did see Brazil's crop estimate come down and, of course, China's demand estimate come down again. But as I say, time will tell if uh, China's demand estimate actually does stay at USDA's lower level. And then lastly, for wheat, uh, overall, I called it neutral. Even though the, the U.S. ending stocks were higher than expected, uh, the world ending stock situation was reduced on the demand increase for uh, India, but overall we still have a very tight situation as far as world ending wheat stocks uh, are concerned. And then before we leave, I just want to remind us as we head into the May WASDA report, and again that comes up on May 12th next month, and of course we'll have our 12:30 webinar once again. But uh, this is what's at risk for the year ahead. This is a listing of Ukraine's production uh, in 2021 uh, before Russia attacked. So this is the potential uh, that uh, this uh, country contributes, not only to their own folks, but to the world in the way of exports. We have corn, 1.6 billion bushels, wheat, 1.2 billion bushels, sunflower oil, the uh, number one exporter of sunflower oil in the world, just over 16 billion pounds produced, and barley, the number three exporter in the world with almost 470 million bushels uh, produced. So it's a very uh, fertile and um, ag-rich place to be uh, in Ukraine, and it's just uh, a terrible shame what's happening there right now. So it's going to be very tough in 2022, uh, largely without a lot of that uh, production. And um, you might ask, you know, what, what's your best estimates as far as what do you think Ukraine will get planted uh, or produced this year? And, I, you know, obviously that's very difficult. And I, I try to read uh, all the analysts from that part of the world, what they're saying. And uh, it, it seems reasonable to start off with just expecting roughly half the production that they normally have is probably a good rough estimate. And my question, though, is how much of that, if any, will actually be able to get exported? And I think that's where the real concern is, because uh, you can grow and harvest all the wheat and the corn and the crops, but boy, once you put them in those grain facilities, they're very vulnerable to attack. They're, uh, when you start gathering up in bulk, they're, they're very, very vulnerable. And, of course, uh, they're probably not going to have the luxury of being able to ship out through the Black Sea this year uh, unless something changes dramatically. So I think there's a lot at risk here, uh, not just for Ukraine, but for the world, obviously. And uh, it's going to make it a very difficult year to uh, anticipate. But certainly, I think overall, uh, adds to the bullish scenario for U.S. crop prices this year. 
Andy, this is a good time to take questions if you have any. I do have a couple of questions, Todd. Um, I'll read this one uh, verbatim here. Uh, you knew it was coming, Todd. <laughs> Can you talk more about <laughs> exports to Canada? Oh, gosh. You know what? I'm sorry. I'm going to have to uh, email you on that one. Or uh, just give me a second. Let's see if I can find it out here. Corn exports to Canada. I'm sorry. It stayed at 3.8 million metric tons. That was the same uh, as last month. Gotcha. Uh, and just one more. And of course, um, and, oh, go ahead. Yeah. And I was just going to say, and, and of course, that continues to be a very troubled situation. And uh, I heard recently, not only in, in Canada, but uh, there's some producers, some cattle uh, feeders in Arizona that are having a difficult time getting corn and hay and whatnot. So uh, very, very difficult all around this year, but uh, certainly still in Canada. Yeah, just one more question for you, Todd. Um, any outlook on what the pricing markets are going to do? Any outlook on which markets? The pricing markets is the question. The pricing markets. Um, so, you know, in corn and soybeans, we're near our highest levels in nine years. And uh, normally we would say that the fundamentals don't justify being up this high. But when you have a wartime situation still active and uh, a guy like Crazy Vladimir that you just can't really predict what he's going to do next, uh, it's it's very difficult to know if the situation is going to get worse or going to get better. And uh, so much hinges upon that and so much hinges on our weather. You know, we uh, have a, a weather forecast for the summer ahead that is mainly warm or above normal temperatures and below normal precipitation is our summer forecast here from DTN right now. And to add uh, any prospect of drought <laughs> to the situation that we're currently in already is a bit mind boggling when you start thinking about prices. So that's one reason I have not uh, recommended that anyone make new crop sales yet. And if you have made new crop sales, um, my concern for you is that uh, this is still a market that could get very dangerous. I hope you're prepared with your banker for some uh, expensive margin calls, or maybe you ought to start taking a look at the option board to limit some of that uh, uh, upside risk of having to come up with more cash for margin. So it's it's a very dangerous margin uh, market, and I'm not trying to scare anybody, but I'm just trying to keep you prepared about, um, you know, be, be prepared for the worst that could possibly happen because we just don't know uh, what direction this situation is going to go. Obviously, you know, you'd like to say the odds are it's all going to normalize and work out in the end, and uh, that's all well and good, but sometimes low probability events happen as we've seen the past two years. Yeah, a lot of so many factors this year. Um, yeah. Last question. We just had one come come in. Uh, any idea on the U.S. winter wheat harvest numbers higher or lower than average? BC. Well, uh, I think we're we're probably definitely going to be lower than average. Our crop rating sure didn't start off uh, very well this spring. They said 30% good to excellent. Uh, and th and that included the SRW wheat crop in there. So if you just look at the HRW wheat crop alone, it's it's not a very good scenario right now. That the drought in Texas and western Kansas is pretty entrenched, and Nebraska looks fairly dry uh, as well. So uh, it definitely, I think, it looks like a, a lower than average winter wheat harvest this year. Excellent. All right. Well, uh, that is it. Those are all the questions we have. Um, so I'll go ahead and close this out. Just want to say thank you to everybody for joining today. Um, just another reminder, we will have this uh, session uh, recorded and up uh, as a rebroadcast on DTN.com um, within the next 48 hours. Um, but Todd has put his information up here as he usually does. So feel free to reach out to Todd directly. Um, and I just hope everyone has a wonderful day and a great weekend. And thanks again for joining us. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Andy.